Hello. Hi. Boy, do you look gorgeous. I'm just trying to find a little bit of light here. You look gorgeous. Are you going somewhere fabulous? Absolutely not. I'm locked down in Paris. And in fact, I just came in for a run. What a lovely place to be locked down in. It's not, it's not bad. It's I not bad. I, wanna, I actually have a question for you about Paris Ooh. coming up. But it's such a great time to be talking about your new book, An Entertaining Story. It's that time of year, uh, pandemic or not, right? Um, and so in your introduction of the book, India, you describe your ent entertaining style as intimate, unpolished, and slightly haphazard. How so? Wow. Nothing like jumping right in here. Jumping in. We're jumping in. Um, but I just reread the book, actually, and that statement jumped out at me. I said, I have to ask India that the minute that we speak. I think I'm polished because, because I live on a small island. Most of the time we're entertaining is on the island. And it's not like we're ever able to nip out to a target um, or a large department store to get what we need. So when we run out of matching that, matching napkins or when we don't have uh, the right kind of candles, we have to make do. So that there's always this, a little bit of, of, of the unexpected in the way that we mm, so right. that is the unpolished side. Right. Um, I like to hope that most people um, who come and have dinner or tea or lunch with us leave with, with a certain feeling that was actually rather lovely. So in the unpolished, I don't want people to feel that I'm not making my absolute effort, because I am. Right, it's a combination of the two. Yeah. Um, and I, I had said this to you when we were, we were on the podcast, that the book is so beautiful, obviously. Um, gorgeous Rizzoli book. It's a clever mix of recipes, pictures, and entertaining stories. And on the, on the podcast, you'd said that the book began with you capturing the imagery yourself. And as you began to develop an archive of photos, you saw a theme emerge, and that theme was an entertaining theme. You found yourself documenting, I guess, mostly tabletop decor and celebrations. Is that right? Yes, I think, you know, every time I, I look back and I try and justify how it's happened, or was there a game plan, or did I have a proper schedule mapped out, none of that actually happened. I think for so many years, I was very intimidated by being... Um, the daughter of a very great designer who was known for really setting the world alight with his amazing color schemes and his very imposing eye. And then I came from a family of designers and my brother and my sister-in-law, et cetera, et cetera. So I never, I never really felt comfortable saying I was a designer. So when I found things like tablescaping, um, it was an easy way for me to kind of express my creative side and actually find something that I was rather good at and where there was no competition mm. because my brother is not decorating birthday cakes and mm. my father is not laying a pretty table. So I was able to kind of have some fun with that. And that started years and years and years ago. Um, and then slowly, 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 you know, I find that I, I suddenly find that I have five children. Um, <laughs> and so that there are an awful lot of, uh, there are an awful lot of, of birthdays. So there are an awful lot of birthday cakes. So it was, it was fun. Of course, you know, we go a little deeper than just that um, in the fact that, you know, I like to think that the book isn't just about how to decorate a book, but it's, it's, a meaningful, um, it's a meaningful story from beginning to end um, in the fact that there's, there's lots, that hopefully there's lots of inspiration. As you said, there are a couple of, of uh, recipes, but there's lots of family in it. Um, and my family is the backbone to everything that I do. Yes. Um, and that becomes very important. Um, in, in everything, in every step that I take in life, um, how will this affect children, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I think more than ever, right now, we need yeah. to be thinking about family and entertaining has changed. We still need to lay pretty tables, but it needs to really be family centric. Speaking of family and tablescaping, and it's true that the book is woven with really, really intimate stories. Um, and you know, a lot of just sort of interesting tales about you entertaining and uh, growing up with your family. Uh, there was a couple of, one that I was thinking about was the fact that your father created his own ice cubes, right? You said he, in the book, you tell a little story about how your father 
he paid such attention to detail, obviously, that he, he created his own ice cubes. Did he often get fixated on small details, becoming oh, yeah. obsessed and wanting to find a solution for them? Oh, oh yes. I mean, you know, his whole world was, was design. He lived and breathed it morning, noon and night. Um, so yes, the, the size of the ice cube mattered greatly to him. Um, of course, you know, in today's world, we're like, what are we talking about? <laughs> no, uh, I get it. I totally get but it. You know what? I, I also think that, yes, the world is a bad place. And yes, we need to take a lot of things very, very seriously. But we also still need to really care about the way we live and, and have fun with it as well. Um, and so my father was very, um, he was very controlling in the way that he lived life. And the size of the ice cube did matter to him. So we had these huge, big um, metal ice trays, this big handle that you would pull like this, and these large ice cubes came out. Um, and, and, and it does, it, you know, that's what gives you pleasure. And if that's what makes your your world feel complete, then why not? If you want yes. to, yeah, he. In, but, but you were right about he did he did get quite fixated on things. Um, yeah, suddenly I decided imagine. daffodils were oh. the they were absolutely the wrong yellow. And unfortunately, in front of his library where he sat and worked, there was a huge field of daffodils. So he took his Land Rover and he drove across those. <laughs> squash them down so he didn't have to see their offensive color anymore he also went through a phase of having uh, pepper on his strawberries pepper on his strawberries. and another phase was he liked to drink um and and he went through a phase of having um diet coke and whiskey or something absolutely mad but he didn't want the diet coke fizzy so he would unscrew the tops and let all the fizz go out so it was flat Done. Right, the flavor of the cola, but not the carbonation of the oh. cola. Mm. Uh, he also, in the book, you talk about this as well, that he claims to have invented the word, as you just mentioned, tablescape. Tell me that about that. Do you remember him using the word tablescape? Do you remember a moment of putting a table together when that came about? Is there anything you remember about that? Because it's I, such a used word now. I mean, everyone says tablescape. I find myself saying tablescape, wondering, where tablescape came from i i remember i remember nothing of the, of the origins of that and i'm definitely going to let him say that he invented that okay He's me too not, not here to to say other ways um but my grandfather also claimed that he um coined the phrase vip oh and now that may well be true but my grandfather was of uh uh who knew vip very well yes and and he invented a lot of things, um, and he had a very a, a very great possibly, um, and and you would have seen him on on the crown if you've been watching the last the the, the most recent episode. So you'll know. Do you he, watch? Do you watch the crown? I do. Yes, I do. Okay. Um, what are a few key investments that one should make for easy entertaining? In the book, you talk about folding chairs. You talk about white plates. What comes to mind when you think about what somebody can 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 own to make entertaining a bit more seamless? I realized the other day that I'd gotten rid of all my folding chairs, and I really thought, well, actually, you kind of need folding chairs to have around. I think I think so useful whether you're in a tiny apartment in New York or whether you've got a big large garden. You're entertaining outside. Folding chairs are so essential. Um, lots of children with hands to help lay up the table. That's good too. Um, light, um, you know, especially if we're talking about an evening event. You know, candles. I, I just I think candlelight just immediately gives a sort of atmosphere. It makes you feel romantic. Um, it's good. I, I do um, comment in the book about the best hostess present I was ever given. Yes. The, unbreakable led lights um and and they're they're just they're just fantastic it's like a sort of bistro light um and and they're above you and it's just it's just wonderful I and they're a bit unique in that i think a lot of the ones that we see here in the united states are are, are a different shape these are like globe lights aren't they like aren't they cylindrical yeah they're, they're really great i love that I, that what a great gift um and you talk about platters and you make a really good point in the book about platters that with a platter you know, there's there's got to be something for someone to find to eat on a platter. When with people going gluten free and having very particular tastes, like if you're assembling a platter, you're going to satisfy everyone. Uh, what are your go-to items 
when building a platter? Can you describe one for us, one that you might put together frequently? We are really getting down to the nuts and bolts of today. Oh yeah, we want to tell everybody this how to do this. X is how to build a platter. Um, I, 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 I think I call that um, the culinary idiot. Um, yes, it's so funny. Idiot, because I am an absolute culinary idiot. Um, but my point is, even I can lay a platter. Yeah. Um, and I think platters are fabulous. Um, I, 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 I'll take anything, an, a, an old piece of wood that you can then stain and put all the food on. You can find a piece of a marble slab, anything, anything that kind of feels different, but large. I, th I like it to have sort of have a large to start on. Um, I love color coordinating it. I mean, Third, I love color coordinating the food. So if you've got, you know, red cabbage with a dip or, or a hummus or cranberries, put all those together and then get your greens all together and then get your yellow together. Um, and there are so many things that you can put together, so many easy things. I have a terrible sweet tooth, so I like to have a, a big old honeycomb in there that you could be putting on there. That's your, beautiful to look at too. Your crackers and your, your grissini or whatever. Um, so I think platters are fun. And just as you've pointed out, I do comment that, you know, even with today's, the myriad of different, of difficult tastes that everybody has, someone can't eat this or someone can't eat that. Surely, my God, on a platter, you're going to find something. That That's you such can. a good point. And they're so popular right now. One of the photos in your book um, has a platter of, what, I love this, it's, you know, carrots and Cheetos and asparagus spears and green lollipops. Like, how fun is that? When you say color coordinating, it's sort of like, you can break the rules with food type, but, but just keep it color coordinated. And you made another great point in the book, which was children love that, right? Right? When it, if a child has come around with his yeah. parents, like you like, really, yeah, they, you hit the jackpot there, right? They um, do love like bar drinks parties. And one of your most clever tips in the book, I think, and really beautiful, um, is your use of wine crates for flowers. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? I mean, I think another thing that we're very used to receiving is sort of a box filled with wine, but it's sort of like now I'm, the next time I buy a case of wine, I'm going to demand a wine crate, you know? Well, for some reason, when, um, uh, when we ship our wine to the, um, it comes in these beautiful wooden crates and, you know, you don't want to throw them out because they look so we have them in the store and we use them for different things. I mean, arts and crafts for the kids or whatever it has been over the years and all the rest of it. And it used to be that, that we'd turn them upside down. The kids would stand on them to brush their teeth as a kind of step to get up to the sink. Um, and now, unfortunately, those small children are now in their 20s and they don't need to stand on to brush their teeth. Um, and so, in fact, now I turned it into a way of displaying um, flowers because I just piled up damp newspaper in the bottom of it and then started piling all these beautiful tropical flowers, which, thank God, are free. You find them in our garden. Um, yes, you have beautiful flowers in the barn. They go to oleander, and and I don't then put them in vases. I just put them on the damp newspaper, and have they're piling out of the of the wine crate. It's just beautiful. And one of the things that I love too about the book, and I think this is a great tip that people can adopt, um, is setting up your area for drinks in an unexpected place, whether that's inside of the home, or if you have outdoor space, it's sort of choosing a location uh, that, that's a little bit unexpected. I love that. And you know, in the book, of course, there's some very dramatic photos of you in a long gown in the middle of the water, but with a fully set table and tiki torches. Um, I think that's a great tip for people to just think outside of the box and not have a designated drinks area, right? I, and and indeed dinner, which is why I love folding tables and folding chairs, because you can just move it around. Right. Look, I'm very conscious as well that I do I do live in the Bahamas and we have a large garden and we're very blessed to be able to a eat outside and take advantage of the tropical uh, environment. But but also that I that I do have space to do that. But I even think that if you're if you're living in an apartment in New York, think up different corners of your apartment. Yeah. Maybe that transform the, the kitchen with lots of fairy lights and lots of candles and make it kind of a lovely oasis of something that feels completely different to doing it in your sitting room. Um, I think it's just fun to change it up, not only for your guests, but also for yourself. Yeah, get it, have a new perspective. When we recorded the podcast, you were in Paris, you're in Paris now. And in the book, one, another great story was, you know, you being 18 years old and moving to Paris. Do you take anything of what you've experienced. What is your relationship to Paris? 
And do you incorporate anything about Paris into your entertaining style today? You know, I, I, I lived in Paris when I was, um, how old was I? I was in my just 20. Um, and I drove my rather um, broken down Beetle car from, from England across to, to France. Um, and, and I just wanted to start a new career and have a new life. Um, and, and it was an amazing experience. The only trouble was that um, Christian Louboutin became one of my best friends. We met very early on and he was just, just starting the shoe business. In fact, he was a guard designer at the time. Um, a governor and I was sitting in his office and with her red nail varnish shoes began painting and he said, brilliant, the red. The, the point of that story is that Christian said to me, I will teach you perfect French. You will speak perfect French by the time you leave. I speak appalling French still today. <laughs> Christian spoke much better English by the time yeah. I left. Yeah. The, the French are terrible snobs um, about, about, about allowing the English to speak French. They just don't. You don't you're just not allowed to. Um, yes. So, so um, but um, my entertaining in, in France, you know, it was, we, we arrived here. I, again, I just wanted to take, I didn't want to let COVID get the better of me. I um, love that. I and love we, that on the island for eight months and had an amazing time of all our kids home. We were so lucky in the way we, we were able to have a lockdown with a garden and space. And then I wanted to see my mum desperately and two of my kids needed to get back to school. So we left the island and, and came over to England. I spent some time with her, but then I just thought, you know, Paris is so close. There are so many apartments at the moment that are empty and very affordable to rent. Um, I'm a train ride away from my mum, so I'm still very, very close. Um, and we just, David and I just thought, let, let's take advantage of this moment. So when we first arrived, it was open and it was just beautiful and amazing. And now we're in a lockdown here, but you know, it's still beautiful. I've just run along the Seine. Um, and you just you make, you try to make the most of it. Try, try, try to make the most of what we're going through. Um, otherwise we're gonna have thought, Jesus, what has happened to this year? Um, so that's really what David and I are trying to do. Um, so there's not an awful lot of entertaining at the moment. No. Um, but I did just do an amazing business trip to Avignon um, and, and spent a, um, a couple of days out there with some people we were discussing a whole plan. But again, it was just wonderful to take advantage of being in the countryside um, and having a bit of French fresh. Yes, yes. Um, and we talked a little bit about recipes. There are a few very carefully placed recipes within the book. And the book references somebody that you call Top Banana. Tell us about Top Banana. Well, as I have already admitted, I am a really shit cook. Um, <laughs> and and there, are, there are many other things that I can do, and some of them I can do well, but cooking is definitely not one of them. <laughs> um, so I recognized fairly early on that I needed some help. And when, 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 when my third child, third child, we really do need some help. So in fact, from, from England out to the um, and she's large and enjoys her food. Um, and she started out as a, as a nanny because I was working, so I was still traveling quite a lot and left the kids with her. Uh, and then took some of the kids with me. And, and so we, we sort of did a back and forth of, of who had which kid, where was I going, which kid was. And anyway, she just became a, a really essential part of our lives. And then slowly, slowly, slowly over time, we realized that actually as the kids grew up, she moved from sort of being in, in the nursery or in their bedrooms and to being in the kitchen. Um, and she's a a very competent, very good um, uh, cook, not a chef. And she does very normal food like shepherd's pies and lasagnas. And she does wonderful honey roasted um, sausages. And that recipe is in the book. And she does a beautiful mackerel pate. And so I just thought it would be nice to sprinkle throughout the book some of the recipes that we use. Um, and even an idiot like me can use them. Uh, <laughs> um, and so Top Banana has been with us many years and really truly is part of our family. That um, sausage recipe is such a great, uh, delicious, seems quick and easy, right? Uh, hors d'oeuvre recipe. Very why, quick. why do you think that handwriting invitations makes all the difference? And what types of events would you think are best for handwritten invitations? Is it a birthday as opposed to a, a larger party? You just love I, it. There's never not a time. Never for not a time. Okay. Oh my God, I love handwritten invitations. Whether you've got a beautiful calligrapher doing it, whether you're doing it yourself, whether you get your 12 year old to do it and put a little sprinkle star on the top of it. However, I just think handwritten invitations are just so lovely because they're so much more meaningful. Um, you've thought of the person as you've written your name. You've made the effort to go above and beyond. Um, I, I love everything handwritten if possible. So, so never not. I, never I, not, okay. 
place cards that have got that have got a name in some inventive writing. Um, and again, super easy. Just if you if you don't have good re- handwriting, super easy to ask somebody or look online and try and. Just, it's so easy. Yeah. Why are we not allowed to have comments as we go along? I see we've we can we can we can, um, but it'll uh, we're, we're, we're do you want do you want to have some comments? Well, it's totally up to you. But sometimes questions from from the people who are suffering through this might might. <laughs> okay, um, you talk you talk about you talk about adding a surprise element to the evening, and what have been some of your most memorable surprise elements so people can get an idea for what you mean by that exactly um i think you know when when you're entertaining you never you can never absolutely guarantee what's going to happen you can't guarantee the weather you can't guarantee that we're going to arrive on time you can't guarantee the souffle is going to arrive you can't guarantee that the wine won't be unforked so there's all there's all sorts of that going on um I think it's fun to have something unexpected, whether you're placing two completely different characters next to each other uh, uh, side by side, yes. during, um, whether you're serving a, an unusual hors d'oeuvre or dessert, um, whether you've got a funky playlist, just something that feels a little unexpected. So if you've got friends over again, that there are things that they, they haven't heard, tasted or listened to before. Yes. Um, and you tell some great stories in the book in, uh, having to do with your, some well-known guests. I think Dave Stewart of Eurythmics has a martini recipe in the book. Um, You're right. And, and then, the, you know, I, because I live on a, a funny island, we get amazing different characters who come through. And they're certainly not all Dave Stewart's of the world. There are a lot of very interesting, very normal down-to-earth people who I love. Um, I yes, did, that's for certain. You've, you've viciously turned the comments off well, again. Well, because I think they're affecting our sound. I think you're Ooh. going in and out. Yeah, so I just, I'm doing a little test. Oh, that's no fun. But one of the comments there was, um, how do we entertain during COVID or how has ch- COVID changed the way that yes. we entertain? And I love that question. And I think it's very relevant. Please answer that question. And we'll, we'll turn the comments back on and see if we can get our sound back. But. Well, it's totally relevant, obviously, right now, because, again, we're in lockdown. But just before um, I came over to Paris for the second lockdown, we were in England and we were allowed to be in bubbles. And I don't know in America how it is at the moment. I think different states do it differently. Um, but certainly we were allowed to be in bubbles. Of, um, and I found that actually it was really lovely to go back to inviting um, friends around. And you kind of now really think about who you're going to spend your time with. Yes. Um, I'm just not sure when that when that gets turned off again, you know, when are we going to see our family? When are we going to see this friend? So, so you want to make it even more meaningful. And I love the fact that it's a small bubble. I found like round tables again were really lovely to sit again instead of long tables like that. So that was my feeling of what had changed. Yes. And you, uh, well, I have another question for you about um, how to kind of change our entertainment. We're not, we're not gathering with large groups um, in the way that we once were, but I, I'll leave that till the end. You tell us, so we were talking about there's a martini um, recipe from Dave Stewart uh, of Eurythmics, formerly of Eurythmics. And you also talk, you have, there's a story about how Lenny Kravitz came to dinner um, and he had a very casual dinner, I think, in the kitchen. I'm just curious, do you remember what you served at the time? Oh, that was like super casual. I mean, that was like sort of toasted cheese sandwiches. I mean, Lenny, 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 Lenny's, you know, lives like a hippie on the next door island to us so that you know that's that's easy um but the funny the funny thing about that was uh, was at that time when he came over there was this game that all my kids were playing was guitar hero do you remember that it was, a, it was yes a and they're playing guitar hero and of course there's a lenny kravitz guitar hero character so then lenny got very <laughs> wanted to play the lenny kravitz guitar hero that's character. so great yeah. um somebody is asking about masks as party favors once we get back to and you know oh my god i hadn't thought of that i love that idea thank you thank you for the suggestion that's such fun oh and we're I, getting an how do you spend chris and i love that question too because christmas is a huge part of our our lives and it was a big a big part of me when i was growing up um actually we go to midnight mass and the interesting thing about midnight mass on harbor island is actually it's at 10 o'clock it's not actually at midnight that's that's very bahamian like, wait, Midnight Mass is not at midnight, it's at 10, 10 p.m. But yeah, so we go to Midnight Mass um, and Marissa, who's who's been in our house for years and years and years, sings. So we like to go and listen to Rissy singing on, on, on Beautiful, beautiful. Um, and one of the things that I actually 
mention in the intro to our podcast is how um, will you know in your home in the Bahamas there would be a huge Christmas tree that just transports you as if you're in New England or in England or somewhere else. It's just this grand Christmas tree that really it just it's a sight. It really is a sight to see the way that you have your Christmas tree um, in your living room in uh, at your home in the Bahamas. And you say that you love a theme. And how theme India is theme? How theme is theme? Where should one well, draw the line? Theme can go very wrong. I do have to just quickly say that our Christmas tree um, comes um, across the bay um, from, from Nassau and then probably from Miami and then probably from somewhere in America. <gasps> so it has traveled and it's very thirsty by the time it gets to us, but we oh. do we look after our tree and afterwards we, we burn the wood from the tree. So we are, we're, we're hopefully being with our Christmas tree. Um, but it brings us such joy. We still do continue with it. Um, how, how much of a theme is a theme? Well, I think you can't go wrong with your theme. Um, there, there's one example in the book where I was given some brown cloth and it was beautiful brown cloth. And then, and then it, was the, it was the time of the year on the island where the fame trees were very much in blossom. And I thought, fantastic. And I went out and I cut down all these branches and boughs of flame tree and put them down the middle of this brown cloth. It was cloth. so beautiful to see. No, yeah. it looked like a Hawaiian wedding. It was terrible. Um, what, uh, I was going to say that there, you know, should you host a tape? Should, what is, is there, you're freezing again. I'm going to, there you are. Now, now you're back. Um, you have that image of you in, your, in that beautiful, beautiful dress. So are you saying that a host should never sort of match their table? Or is there a time and a place for that? Well, I, I have fun with that. I, I think maybe I actually looked like a nap um, um, in the dress because the dress was exactly well as what was on the table. Um, but like, you know, there, there are some wonderful theme parties that we've all seen and been to. Like, you know, there's a wonderful full moon white party that you can do, or there's, you know, color themes and all the rest of it. Um, I think it just depends. I think, I think right now, the furthest thing from our mind is a themed party. So I don't think we need to worry too much about it. That's true. Uh, one of the questions in the chat was uh, asking if there is a question to get a conversation started. Um, that you would recommend. I, I know in the book you say to avoid parenting, politics, religion, par parenting, politics, and religion, I think. That, that is excellent. Oh my God, you've really done your homework. I, 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 lo I love the book. I think it's so great. Um, but what do you, those are the things you avoid. Oh yeah. What else, what do you dive into? I think is what somebody's saying. How do we get things started? How do we get people talking? I think it's it's um it's probably you know talking to your neighbor, listening for a start, um, lis listening to them. Um, that, that everybody has something interesting to say. You just have to find what interests them, um, and 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 then you and then, uh, find a spark to conversation. Um, but normally, you know, it, it depends on the age group, doesn't it? You know, I normally connect with somebody over either either the design or the creative world or or, or I ask about their, their children. And, you know, once you start sharing stories of you know, of raising children, although you would say that we had we had said not parenting or politics. Um, but I think you, if you find a shared passion, then immediately a conversation is part. Yeah. Yeah. Um just switching gears, we talked a little bit about candles. Do you have any rules for candlelight at a table? None, none. I'm a little bit hesitant about those candles with the fake thing that flickers like this. <laughs> Having said that, I think there are some very, very good ones out there at the moment that when you actually do arrive at the house, you go, oh my God, look at all these beautiful candles and you realize it's got its battery run. Um, but it's rather like fake flowers, isn't it? After a while you feel slightly cheated by that. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, and sure. Where I was, at. I was thinking that maybe the best way to use a candle like that um, is to put it inside of something, so you just get this the appearance that it's a real flickering candle, but you can't really tell that it, it, it's it's a fake candle. Um, let's look at your book. I want you to describe the tape. This describe your blue. I'm going to call it the blue party. It was a party that you had. I think, was it for, you know, in celebration of your company and your line? And I think it's, here, let's, let's show it one more time. I think it's a perfect example of 
just genius creativity in putting a table together. Can you describe what you did there? Well, budget is a big word. Um, and that was one of the big words we were using that evening. Um, I, I really wanted to thank all the fantastic women that I had been working with. And we had about 50, 60 of them um, for dinner. Um, and yet we were on a tight budget. And I suddenly thought, how can I make this different? And the sudden thought came to actually, we were running a lifestyle at the time, looked in the excess dock room, what to have to sell. And it was, this, it was these, um, these uh, towels um, with an India block on one side and then toweling on the other side. And I sort of thought, why don't we make these into table runners? So we sliced them down the middle and we, we set them together and we made a big dramatic table. And then we had these vases come in and bought bamboo very simply um, from, from Target or somewhere off, the, off Amazon. I ordered those uh, Chinese paper um, lanterns and I just tied them with fishing wire to the bamboo, put them in these big vases. And I think it made quite a dramatic scene. We did hire the plates. Um, we looked for blue and white plates, which we were able to find. It was out in California. Um, and so we had a, a, a wonderful event organizer who was able to find that for us. Um, and and I, I, I often have um, the same girlfriends come with me. And so we do it together and we kind of feed off each other in the same way that's happening tonight. Like someone has suggested masks as party favors and you've said put your candles in glass things to hide the fact that they're battery operated. Um, so the girlfriends and I suddenly say, right, let's do this, this. And, and it's just so lovely. So it's never a professional team and it's very spur of the moment. Um, we're always trying to think creatively and how to make it come fun and as inexpensive as possible. I keep touching my hair because I keep thinking it looks like I've got a ferret on my shoulder. I don't think so. I love this long, it, long low pony. I think it, it looks it, I love the long, low pony. Your hair's so long. Uh, where was that event? I'm curious. Was that? It was outside of Los Angeles in the hills somewhere. And I'm having a craft moment. Can't remember a fucking thing. But when my craft moment is over, I'll remember where it was. <laughs> How often do you entertain India? Let's think, let's sort of think pre-pandemic. Like how, how often are you typically entertaining or hosting? You know, again, because, because I live on a small island in the Bahamas, um, we're, we're able to host things outside. And because Harbour Island is a place where many people come through, um, and often there are friends of friends who come. And it, it's nice when you live there to be able to invite people over. So they have a, a different experience that's not just you know, a hotel. Um, but really it's driven because my kids are, you know, there are five of them and they all have friends who come over. So we, our home um, is pretty active. Um, and even like at Christmas time, it might be that we're very family at Christmas time. It may not be that we're certainly not having big dinners, but it may be that I invite people for Christmas tea or to come over to have mince pies or just something um, that feels um, inviting, warm, cozy and intimate. And in the book, you talk uh, a lot about how you're very spontaneous. On, on, on the podcast, we talk about how you, you have a spontaneous streak. And in the book, you kind of touch on that, too. Can you recall a moment of, you know, total spontaneity in throwing something together where you actually really impressed yourself? You thought, wow, I cannot believe that, that we, uh, you know, this, we really pulled this one off. Um. I can't think of kind of sensational example, but I can think of a very recent example. When we, when we, when we, when we arrived in London, um, and again, it was just, just before the lockdown, it was small bubbles of people. Um, and so we invited two sets of, of friends to come over, um, and we were borrowing a friend's house in London. That was, none of it was mine, so I didn't know where to find anything. I knew I wanted to be outside in the garden to be safer, uh, so we weren't inside. Um, and we, we found this kind of little tiny table that obviously her kids had used to do play-doh and arts and crafts um and then we found a tablecloth that was pink and then i found some plates um and then i i went around the house and i found all sorts of different sized candles from all sorts of different rooms um i ma amassed all the different candles it began to look a little bit like a seance and then i realized around the outside of the garden growing on the wall wild was some jasmine um and with with quite a lot of weed and trapped in it and i and I cut quite a lot of this down and I just had the jasmine with all these weeds wrapped around all the candles on top of the pink tablecloth with the pottery plates all around. And it was kind of, it was very spontaneous um, and very, and it kind of suddenly looked kind of weird. So, wow, that's kind of fun. Um, yeah, magical. From nothing. Um, yeah, exactly. And it smelled really good. Not only was it all the candles, but it was also the jasmine wrapped all around the candle, the candle holders. Beautiful. 
What coming, uh, upcoming events and holidays are you celebrating this year? What's on deck for you? God, whatever we're allowed to do. Yeah. Um, you, um, you know, Christmas, obviously, and um, New Year's. I don't, I'm not American, so I don't celebrate Thanksgiving. Um, but Christmas and New Year's will be big for us um, in the fact that you know, it's a time where all the kids will be home. Um, and it may just be David and me and the five kids. And it may be you know, all the waifs and strays that I normally invite who are friends who've been on the island and don't have a home to go to. So we'll, we'll just see. Um, I work a lot with two foundations. That are very important to me. One is the global mission, um, uh, a global empowerment mission, Gem, um, and I've worked with them since the hurricane last year. And they're an amazing foundation. They're doing an awful lot of good. And together, I've been raising money for them, and they've been putting that into uh, practical source resources. And we've built two schools out in Abaco. Um, and this holiday season, I'd really like to go back out to Abaco and and take the kids, those kids out there, um, some games and some. Um, and some toys and some presents because this will probably be the second year that an awful lot of those people are still living under canvas. They still don't have homes. Yes. Have anywhere to go. Um, yes. Second really shitty Christmas for them. So if we can, we'd like to do that. And, um, of course, I'm very involved with the Harvard Food Bank. We started with a, a small group of friends um, seven months ago and we've been able to keep that going. Um, so if anybody here on this call tonight is, is at all interested um, in knowing more about that, please find um, we have a, uh, a GoFundMe account set up, very easy to find. It's called the Bryland Food um, And any amount is so gratefully received right now because they have full funding, um, which means that we will we'll now struggle to get through the holiday season and feeding the people on Harbour Island, North Luthra, who, having been part of a very strong tourist business, obviously now have, we have no tourist business whatsoever. So We can post something about that too in the podcast show notes. Thank you. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll definitely do that. Um, and as we wrap up, we, we talked a little bit about this earlier, but the current pandemic has, you know, put a halt to these larger gatherings. And if you're India, if you're, if this year you're two people, let's say as when, you know, small groups, two people, maybe three, maybe four, maybe five, is there anything that you'd suggest? Is it important to keep things festive? Yes. Oh my God. I think more than ever, we more need than ever. A, keep our sense of humor, and, and B, just have a little bit of fun. And I know that is so hard to say, so easy to say and so hard to do, but we are all riddled with concern. We are all feeling a little desperate. We are all feeling very uneasy. Um, but if you, if you get together with friends and people, for God's sakes, drink um, and, <laughs> and try and have fun because you know we need those moments now. We really do. Yes. India, thank you so much. It was so good to talk to you again here from Paris. Episode 54 is released. It's live now. It's on Apple Podcasts. It's on Spotify. It's on everywhere else. Um, you can also discover some of India's um, favorite things um, that she talks about in our chat. Um, and uh, happy holidays. Well, thank you very much. I hope to see you soon. I hope to see you I was actually supposed to come to the Bahamas and then that trip got canceled. So, yeah. Well, I was very, very grateful that you had me on and thank you very much indeed. And as I said, my ferret, Always. My ferret and I had a lovely evening. Thank Your you. Your ferret is beautiful. Thank <laughs> you, India. All right. Lots of love. Bye. Lots of love.